Well, good morning, everybody. Certainly, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. What an amazing morning this is that God has given us a very significant time in uh, the life of the Christian church, as this is Holy Saturday. Uh, this was the day uh, that Jesus certainly uh, was placed uh, and laid, rather, laying in Joseph of, of, of Arimathea's borrowed tomb. The stone was on the top of the tomb, in front of the tomb, and persons were uh, sad and uh, frustrated and disheveled, hopeless and feeling helpless. They didn't know, uh, they didn't have an assurance within uh, that Resurrection Sunday was coming the next morning. And so uh, this is a space of stillness and a space of quiet. And so we acknowledge that uh, the space in between crucifixion and resurrection. When I was growing up, Holy Saturday was the day where everybody did all their last minute running around. They did their last minute running around to get their Easter dinner stuff together. They did their last minute uh, running around to get their Easter outfit together. And here we are uh, yet and still for the second time in a row, um, uh, for second year in a row, uh, in the middle of this global pandemic, uh, where most of us are not doing that. Persons who are gathering for worship tomorrow in person, most are doing so at a social distance and significant reduced capacity. Others are gathering, uh, doing pull-up services, staying in their cars. Uh, but it's most important that we understand the reason for this season, um, even though we're not able to connect in most cases to our liturgical and our religious traditions. But we are glad and uh, so full of praise that Jesus would decide to die for us and that God would be faithful to his word to raise him from the dead on that third day morning. And so we gather this morning to continue stretching. Uh, we declared that this year, 2021, was the year to stretch in our faith, our family, our finance, and our fitness. And we've been doing just that. Uh, we have been stretching in faith. Uh, we have been stretching and engaging with our families um, and spending time with our families and being intentional of how uh, we communicate and dialogue. We've been stretching in our fitness, making sure that we take care of our physical temples. The body says, don't uh, the Bible says, don't we know that our bodies are the temple of the Lord and that God's spirit dwells in us? But we have also been stretching financially. I've been so blessed uh, to see the growth in many of the persons who have been registered in all of our various Victory Bible Institute growth groups uh, for our winter semester. We had an amazing time in our men's group and in our women's group and with Noonday Bible Study with Pastor Faye and with our young adults. Uh, but today uh, we're gonna be talking about money and how we can grow in our discipleship and money. And our financial fitness class has had such amazing testimonies of growth and development that I could not let the opportunity go by for us en masse in everybody that's connected to us to be able to witness the teaching gift of this amazing woman of God, Lisa Baker. So before I bring her on, I want to ask everybody that is watching right now to take a moment and share this broadcast. If you're watching via Facebook, it's really simple. It's the press of a button uh, and press share. Uh, today will be the last time that I'm asking you all to do that, uh, as today is our last official day as the lead pastor of Hope Fellowship Church. Uh, we are in transition, but I could not be happier that this is the last activity that I will lead uh, in helping our saints and helping people all over uh, everywhere uh, to come into alignment and to come into an understanding of our discipleship when it comes to our money. Uh, so go ahead and once you share, please let me know that you shared and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Just giving everybody uh, time to get in. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about anything else, more than he talked about salvation, more than he talked about casting out demons and healing bodies, more than he talked about any other thing in his parables and in his teaching, Jesus talked about money. We, most cases, black wees, are afraid, ashamed, and sometimes reticent and hesitant to talk about it. But what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about it. It's uncomfortable, but we're going to talk about it. And I guarantee you, 
that everything that you've probably said you can't do and all the reasons that you place in your mind, barriers as to why you can't, shan't, shouldn't, or won't engage in discussion, today God's going to open your brain and your mind and your intellect to a completely new way of thinking. And so I pray that you're open for that. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness is better than life. And for that, our lips will praise your name. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this holy week. Thank you for uh, this holy Saturday. Uh, we are so honored, God, by the sacrifice that you made for us on Calvary. You paid a debt that you did not owe. Uh, and you sowed a seed that we could not sow. And so thank you for your grace. Now, Father, be glorified in our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to introduce this morning. She's quickly, uh, she don't know it because we don't talk often, but she's quickly become one of my favorite people, really, she has. Um, she's done such an amazing job and she has such a powerful testimony. I want to present to us this morning, Miss Lisa L. Baker. Could you welcome Lisa, everybody, with some hearts and some thumbs up in the chat? Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. So glad to have you with us this morning. Everybody, let's throw in the chat. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome. Let's welcome her this morning. She's no stranger now to the Victory Center. She's been with us for several weeks in our financial fitness class. Uh, she has uh, just an amazing uh, cachet and gathering of skills. And now she's a uh, embarking upon uh, her own consultation and life coaching uh, company um, as, as an executive coach. Uh, she's retired, uh, but you know, she, <laughs> but, but she's young. Y'all looking like retired. Yeah. That's why we're here to talk about money. Cause some of us want to be in the same position. Hey, hey glory. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to take away from her presentation time, uh, but but Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing uh, with our church and uh, with our young adults and with those who had registered for our financial fitness class. Uh, there's no way we could pay you uh, for all the expertise and insight that you've provided. Uh, but I wanted you to come this morning to be able to uh, give a broader a, a, a broader presentation to, to an audience who may not have been able to go through uh, the Dave Ramsey financial piece uh, or Crown Financial, rather, curriculum that you've been leading us through. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to throw it, the ball into your court. I'm not going to try to uh, ask any questions to get the ball rolling. Lisa, it's on you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here today. It is my privilege to serve in this space, to come alongside and help people to um, change their financial futures. And so I'm going to dive into the presentation I'm going to share here. Um, I invite you to put your questions into um, the, the chat as we are going through this process. Now, I will not be able to answer your questions while I'm presenting, but I promise to leave time at the end of the conversation so that I can answer any questions that you might have. I know there's a, there will be undoubtedly a lot. I want to set the the expectation really even um, from the very beginning here that um, there's that we're going to go through a lot of information and that that as we go through all of that information it it may seem overwhelming it may seem like you're getting um, you know more information than you can process or take in in the moment but do not allow yourself to get overwhelmed at all. Don't um, be uh, fearful. We are going to get through it together. And um, we'll get through it together. That's that's the, the first thing. And that I will give you my contact information at the end so that if you have questions, if you want a personal coach for yourself and you say, hey, Lisa, I want to, um, I, I, I need your help. All you have to do is reach out and I promise that I will be there to do my best to serve you um, as the Lord has um, called me to do. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, Pastor JP said, I have started um, a business, 
a symptom. It is a coaching practice where our uh, motto is here you grow. And today we're going to be talking about one of the areas that I um, coach in, and that's individual coaching and group class. And it's around your finances. Grow finances is to, um, grow is to get out of debt, retain more income, organize your assets so that you can walk in wealth. And we're going to dive right in. I'll give you a little bit of my background. Talk about the financial crisis that many in the U.S. are experiencing today. And then talk about what I really believe is the solution to that. And that is the grow finance model. And then I'm going to invite you to make a personal commitment to grow. As I said, we're going to go through a lot of good information, but it's not really valuable unless you make the commitment to do something as a result of what you're going to hear today. And then I'll answer some of your questions. As I said, I may not be able to get to all of them, but I do promise to leave time at the end so that I can answer your questions through the chat. And here's the commitment that I want you to make. As we go throughout the presentation today, I want you to ask yourself a question. What is one change I will make this week to move a step closer to financial freedom. One step, one change this week that you will commit to making to move yourself closer to financial freedom. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about me and why I do this and why I'm so passionate about it. My personal money motto is this, if you tell your money where to go, you won't have to wonder where it went. I have um, had a number of major financial milestones in my life. And what I can tell you is that when you make a commitment to honor God with your money, he will bless you and bring more to you. So like many people, I made a series of um, decisions financially that seemed right at the time, but that turned out to be really poor decisions. For example, I cashed out not one, but two 401k plans to get the money to pay off debts um, and to start a um, business. That was really not, those weren't good financial decisions. Um, I had four homes that I owned. Several of them were rental properties because I had the thought of investing in real estate as a way to build wealth. And that is a good idea, but I didn't take the right approach to doing it. The financial crisis hit and I was left with four properties, some of which were underwater that I couldn't sell. And all of that led me to bankruptcy court. When I went into bankruptcy, I had over a million dollars in debt. A couple of years after that, I got divorced. That's a financial milestone for anyone who's gone through a divorce. You know that that can have a significant impact on you financially. At the same time, though, God allowed me to start a new job. And that new job gave me hope and excitement and more energy about my future. Um, but I also, at the same time, started to create more debt, even though bankruptcy had technically made me 100% debt free. But my kids were in college and I was trying to help them with that. So many decisions that, again, seemed right at the time, but really were financially ill advised. But when I made the decision to repent to God for how I had mismanaged the assets that he allowed me to have, then he got engaged and things started to align to bring me to the place where I am today. So in a relatively short period of time, if you look at the milestones on the screen, God took me from having really over $1.4 million in debt to being here today talking to you about growing your finances. I am retired, as Pastor shared with you. I'm 54 years old and I retired, but not because retirement is an age, retirement is a financial number. When you get to the place that you have saved and invested enough that you can live out your retirement years and not have to work, then you can retire. That doesn't have to come when you're 65 or 68 or 70 if you manage your financial life well. And so that's why I'm here. I am financially now, again, debt free with the exception of my mortgage. And I am working very hard, my husband and I, to have that paid off within the next three to five years so that, again, we will have absolutely no debt. 
I remarried. You heard me mention my husband. And I list that as a financial milestone too. And I want to insert this parenthetically. If you're planning to join your life to someone else's life, you must have financial conversations well before you get married. You need to know what their, how much debt they have, how much they make, what their credit score is. You need to share that about yourself as well so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to join your life to that person's life. So let's get into it. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, every year they do an annual report that is entitled The Economic Well-Being of U.S. Households. And they will look at things like how much people are making, how much are they saving, are they investing or not, how much debt the average household has. The 2019 report concluded, amongst other things, this, that most adults are not financially doing well in the United States, that they are not capable of withstanding even a small financial disruption. A small disruption in the definition of this report is a $400 emergency. Most Americans cannot handle even a $400 emergency. That means that they would have to go into debt, borrow the money, or not take care of that situation because they don't have $400 in cash. And so that's why we're here. Despite all the gains that have happened in our economy over the years, people are still struggling financially. And that is even more pronounced amongst minorities and people of color. So what is it that's causing this financial distress? Well, most people can't handle a $400 emergency, so it's no surprise that they can't handle a $1,000 emergency. 64% of people cannot handle a $1,000 emergency, and that's because the majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck. The average household has over $140,000 in debt, and that is student loan debts. Over half of students take out a student loan, and about 20% of income goes to paying student loans, credit card debts. Most people have not just one, the average person has four credit cards with a balance of around $6,000 per card. Then there are car loans. Whether it's a new or a used car, having car loans is another thing that's contributing. The average car loan for a used car is over $20,000. And then there's mortgage debt. It's a good thing that 68% of Americans actually own their home, but that is yet another debt that people are trying to pay. And so you might think that the problem is one of income. We just need more money to be able to take care of our debts. I would submit to you that that is not true because it's not how much you make that matters, but how much you keep. You know, there, you probably know someone who makes what you think is a good salary. Or think about someone famous a mil that makes millions of dollars, athletes, stars, and you hear about them being bankrupt because it's not that they weren't making enough money, they weren't keeping enough of what they make. And here's why. The average American makes around $63,000 a year. That is a good salary. Now that's before taxes to be fair. But even after taxes, that's over $4,000 a month that's coming into the average household. But look at where it's going. If you own your home, a car, a, a house payment, the mortgage is around $1,700 a month. If you're renting, it's a little bit less, but the, a one bedroom apartment is over $1,000 a month. And it's much more than that, depending on where you live. Transportation costs paying for your car, putting gas in the car, that's over $800 a month. Then there are all those other things we need, like food, cell phones, our utilities. Look at the expenses for those things. For our people that have children, especially small children that need daycare, look at what daycare costs are. In Mississippi, which is the state that has the lowest cost for child care, the average person in Mississippi is paying $453 a month for child care. If you live in Massachusetts, 
the state that has the highest average cost for child care, that's over $1,700 a month. So it's no surprise that Americans are struggling financially, even with earning a good salary as high as 63,000 or more for some, maybe less for others, but it's all of these expenses. It's all of the outgo that's keeping us in financial distress. And so the solution to that is we have to grow. To grow your finances will put you in a place where you're building wealth so that you can give generously and leave a legacy for the future. So we're gonna talk about for the remainder of the discussion, we're gonna go through this process of how you get out of debt, retain or keep more of your income, organize your assets so that you can walk in wealth. There are steps to financial freedom. And Robert Kiyosaki said this, financial freedom is available to those who learn about it and work for it. We're gonna learn about it today, but the work is so important. The only place where success precedes work is in the dictionary. So it's going to require work on your part. I'm gonna tell you the seven baby steps to getting to financial freedom. The first thing, step one, is you have to save. Save at least $1,000 for your starter emergency fund. Now, if you earn less than $20,000 a year, then your emergency fund to start can be $500. Once you get that money saved, then you're gonna move to the next step, which is paying off your debts. And you wanna pay off all of your debt with the exception of your mortgage as your baby step number two. And we'll use the debt snowball and I'll tell you more about what that is a little bit later. Once you've paid off your debt, except your mortgage, then you want to increase your savings. You're going to go from that thousand dollar starter fund to saving at least three to six months of your expenses. So if you, if your expenses are $5,000 a month, then you'd need at least 15,000 in your full emergency fund. Once you have your full emergency fund, then you can shift your focus to investing. And this is where it really gets exciting, where you can start to see your money grow. You wanna invest at least 15% of your household income. If you're investing 15%, then it's easy to do the math to say that you have to live on less than 100% of what you make. If you have children, that are um, going to be going to college, you wanna then start saving for your children's college so that they don't have to be amongst those 54% of people that are taking out student loans and going into debt for that. Once you get through that step, then you're ready to begin focusing on paying off your home if you have a mortgage. If you don't have a mortgage, this is the time when you start to save so that you can buy a home. And then lastly, the step that we're all working toward is that place where we are free financially so that wealth is building, our money is growing day by day, and we are able to give and be lavish givers in the kingdom of God. All right. So now let's talk about how we get out of debt, how we go from being in financial bondage, which we described many of us are in, in the United States and indeed around the world. The Bible tells us that the rich rule over the poor, that the borrower is slave to the lender. So you have to understand that debt makes you a slave. So the first step that you're going to take in getting out of debt is you must change your mind. You have to have at least two key primary mindset shifts at this stage. The first shift or mind change that has to happen is you have to go from thinking of yourself as an owner, meaning you possess the things that you have, they are yours, you own them, to being that of a steward or merely a manager of the things that you have. God owns everything. He merely entrusts it to you so that you can steward or manage it. And it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. So that's the first shift. God, it belongs to you. I am your manager of what you've given me. And you understand that God expects a return for what he, he has invested in you. The second shift that you have to make is from that of a consumer to an investor. 
consumers buy, spend money on things that have little value to begin with and depreciate and have even less value over time. Investors buy things that have value to begin with and appreciate or grow in value over time. Those are the two primary shifts to start. We're transformed by renewing our minds. So let's make the shift. Then you need a plan. The plan is your budget. This is where you tell your money where to go. A good budget will be one that you do monthly, where you're tracking all of your expenses, all of your income, and it should be a zero dollar budget. Meaning if you earn $2,000 this month, then you should have a plan or an assignment for every dollar. So you should have expenses of 2000. We call them expenses, but it's really giving an assignment to each dollar. Once you have your budget set, you look for ways to reduce your expenses. Where can you cut back so that you have more money to put toward categories that are important, like saving, like reducing debt? You may also need to increase your income. Look for ways to bring in more. Maybe you need a second job. Maybe you um, have things that you can sell that you're not using that you can get cash for to, to bring in more money into your household. But however you can, you must reduce expenses, try to increase your income, and then that frees you up to have more money to put into your debt snowball to get all of your debts paid off. And that's how you get to real financial freedom. But the key to this is that if you want to get out of debt and stay out of debt, you have to act your wage. That means we can't keep up with the Joneses. We're not going to be able to keep up with the Kardashians. You have to be an effective manager of what God has entrusted to you. So, I've talked about the debt snowball, and I want to take this moment to share a video that will explain how the debt snowball works so that you know how you can get out of debt. I stopped sharing because I am told that um, you're not able to hear the audio. Um, so I apologize for that. So let me just tell you how the debt 
um, snowball works before we get into retaining more income. Essentially, it's this. You look for, we'll call it extra money in your budget. The suggestion is that you find $200 extra by either selling something, adjusting your expenses so that you'll have um, those extra funds. Then you're going to order your debts from the lowest balance to the highest balance. And you're going to pay the minimum payment on each of your debts until you um, start to pay them off. So what happens? Your first debt, you put the $200 extra you found plus the minimum payment, and you do that for that debt until you pay it off. Everything else, you would be paying the minimum. Once you've paid off that first debt, then you snowball that payment into the next debt. So in the example that was being shown, you had one debt that had a minimum payment of $50, you were adding your extra 200 with it so that you're paying $250 per month. When you finish paying that debt off, you take that 250, add it to the minimum payment of your next debt so that you're paying even more on that. When you do that process, you start to gain momentum and you will quickly be able to pay off debt. So what may have taken you 12 years to pay off, you can pay off in three or four by using the debt snowball process. Um, and so that is the concept. I apologize that the sound wasn't playing. I thought I was sharing the sound. We'll um, get that corrected um, going forward. Um, so now let's talk about how you keep more of your income. Um, many people have it sort of backwards in terms of saving. And so this is an example of another one of those mindset shifts. Most people will say, well, I'm going to pay all of my bills. And then if I have something left, I'll save that. I'm going to ask you to make the shift to do it in the exact reverse. Save first. And then after you save, spend what's left. That's the idea. So let's talk about some easy ways that you can save here. And I've put 10, there's, there's others. The first thing is having that budget, creating the budget, sticking with it is going to help you save. You wanna track all of your expenses so that you can see where your money is going and then tell it where you wanna go as opposed to allowing it to just go out freely. Look for ways that you can, to pay yourself, as we said, do that before you pay your bills, try to make it automatic. So automatically have, um, funds from your check direct deposited into a savings account. Um, if your organization that you work for has a 401k or TSP plan, make sure you're investing in those plans. Let that savings be automatic. Um, there are high, many high interest bank accounts that are available now so that you can save and grow interest faster. Um, look for ways to find those. There's Borrow is one that has a very high interest rate for saving. The Synchrony um, Bank, Synchrony is the organization I used to work for, um, has a great rates on, on savings accounts. So look for that. Simple things like keeping a spare change or bills. Now, I know a lot of people don't keep cash anymore, but if you pay for something in cash, you get change back, throw it in a jar or something, put it aside. You'll be surprised how much money you can save that way. Um, there are also apps now. There's an app for just about everything. And there are certainly apps that encourage and help you to save. Acorns is one. Many banks will have a keep the change uh, kind of program. I know at Bank of America, they do that. So if you go and you purchase something on your debit card and the cost is $10 and 49 cents, they'll round it up to $11, but the extra 51 cents goes into a savings account for you. So look for things like that and ways to just reduce any spending that's unnecessary. You have to understand the difference between a want and a need. And even things you want, you may have to delay getting those until the future so that you can save for now. Things like conserving energy in your home. My mom had many funny sayings, one of which was she would say to me, turn out those lights and get the man out of my pocket. And I thought, what man is she talking about? But she's talking about conserving energy to reduce expenses so that unnecessary dollars weren't going out of her pocket. And we can all do that. 
having a programmable thermostat and things that help you to be energy efficient so that your utility bills are as low as they possibly can be. If you can downgrade services on things, we don't have to have you know all of the premium channels on your cable station, cut back to basic cable so that you have more money to put towards your debt snowball. Any elimination of any unnecessary fees, late fees, um, bounce check charges, uh, annual fees on things, try to eliminate all of those from your life and then take that money um, and keep it for your plan, which is your budget, whether you assign it to savings or assign it to paying off debt. But that's how you find a way to get those extra dollars for your debt snowball. Make this your mantra. It was mine when I was trying to get out of debt. Admire don't acquire. You can see great things that other people are doing and that they have. You can admire it, but don't go trying to acquire those things for yourself. Now, here's a real life example of how I saved a thousand dollars per month. I've been teaching financial fitness class for the last seven weeks. And while my students were going through the class, I was going through all the process with them. And just here's some simple examples. I had a, a credit card that had an annual fee of $39. I called the credit card company, asked them to change the account to one that doesn't have a fee. Boom, that's $39 a year I can save. I had some subscription services that I wasn't really using. Disney Plus, Audible, HBO Max, um, Fenty, I don't need those things, really. I canceled all of those. So those payments go to zero. Um, my husband and I were on separate cell phone plans. I was on Sprint. He was on AT&T. We both went over to um, Xfinity where we can share a data plan. Now our cell phone bill is only $30 a month for both of us. Um, I talked to Xfinity, adjusted my services there. And what you can see is that the result of all of those seemingly small changes is about $213 a month, which is $2,500 a year. I own my home, as I mentioned, and so I um, refinanced my mortgage, lowered the interest rate, which saved me $800 a month on the monthly payment. Now I can assign that $800 to something else. I'm actually keeping it as putting it toward the mortgage. That means I'll pay off the mortgage even faster. So those are just examples. Your numbers may be different from mine, but those are ways that you can look into your personal finances and see where you can find opportunities to save so that you can invest, get out of debt faster, keep more of what you earn. And I'm going to take a moment right here and pause. And I want you to just think, imagine, how much could you have saved if you hadn't spent a lot of money on things that were unnecessary because you were trying to get attention or you wanted to feel important in the eyes of others? I know for me, I could have saved a lot of money if I'd made different decisions. So again, as we're going through this, ask yourself, what commitment can you make to changing this week? Now we're going to talk about the next step in the grow process, which is organizing your assets. This is where you take an inventory of the things that you have that are assets, Figure out a plan to safeguard them so that you can, again, keep more of what you have and allow your investments to grow. You want to organize important documents, make sure that somebody you trust knows where they are. This is what we're going to call getting your financial house in order. And I want you to think of it like a house. And we're going to build this out. So the first thing is your health. You are your asset. If you, you need to be healthy in order to work and grow. Hello. Put the PowerPoint back up. Oh. Hang on. I seem to be having technical difficulties today. We're going to get there, though. Um. Can you, somebody tell me, can you hear me? Can you see the slides? I think the answer is yes, that you can hear me, you can see the slides. 
Um, Felicia, you've been texting me. You confirmed for me. Thank you so much. I apologize. I don't know what's happening, but this information is going to get out today. So bear with me. And at the end, if you have questions, we'll go through the um, parts that I miss. Thank you, Felicia, for letting me know that you can hear me and see the slides. Um, OK, so organizing our assets to protect what we have. I want you to think about it like your house. We're getting our financial house in order. We're going to start with our health. Make sure that you have health insurance, that you're taking care of yourself, first of all, so you can remain healthy. But you need health insurance and you want to protect yourself. You are one of your assets. Um, purchase as much insurance as your budget will allow and make sure that you're paying attention to out-of-pocket maximums because medical emergencies can cost us a lot of money. The average medical expense per month is around $400. So you want to really make sure that you are taking care of your health, that you're insured so that you're not um, put into a difficult financial situation because you don't have adequate health insurance. Then you also want to have disability insurance. This is to cover you in the event that you can't do the work that you were educated or trained to do. You should have at least 65% of your income covered through your disability insurance. Then you'll need long-term care insurance as well. If you're 60 years or older, this is an absolute must. But even younger people can get into situations, an accident or something can happen where you need in um, home health care. Maybe you need to be in a rehabilitation center for a while. So long term care is another way in which we can protect and build our financial house. OK, then our life life insurance replaces income in the event of, that someone dies or that you die. So you want to have that so that your family is protected and covered. It's also a way to create wealth. Um, and leave an inheritance for your children's children, as the Bible says a wise person does. You'll want your life insurance to be at least 10, but somewhere between 10 and 12 times what your salary is, is what your life insurance should be. Then as you start to grow your finances and have more assets, you will find that people um, will try to come for you. It's just what it is. So you'll want to have identity theft insurance. You may want to consider having an umbrella liability policy in case someone wants to sue you. And of course, you're going to protect your car, your home. Um, if you're a renter, you want renter's insurance so that you can protect your possessions. Now, these are the things that people may normally think about and have covered, but you'll notice that our house isn't complete. And because that's a major piece that's missing that I want to tell you about and encourage everybody to make sure that you protect your assets and your legacy by having a will, by having an advanced health care directive that tells people what you want to happen in the event that you're sick and you can't make decisions for yourself. You want someone to have a power of attorney to handle your finances for you, somebody that you trust. You may need a living trust. But this is so key. Over 60 percent of people in America do not have a will. Even very wealthy people. You've heard the stories in the news that died without a will. And what that means is that the state now has to come in and make decisions about what happens to your assets. So you've worked hard. You've invested. You've saved. You've done all of that. But if you don't have a will, if you don't have a power of attorney, then you could lose all of those assets for that reason. So protect yourself, get your financial house in order. All right, walking in wealth now. We're on the last step of this process. Um, as we're talking about wealth in terms of money today, I want to put the disclaimer in here. We know wealth is more than just financial gain. Um, it's your health. It's your heart in terms of being loving and generous. It's so much more. It's all those spiritual gifts that God has given us. It's our friends and connections. So many things that make us wealthy. But we're talking today specifically about money. As it relates to money, there's really only three things you can do with it. You can spend it, which most people are doing. You can invest it. You can give it away. Most people are spending so much that they have very little to invest or give. 
Remember, we're talking about making mindset shifts. So when you shift from the position of consumer to investor, from owner to steward, then you shift what you do with your money. Investing it becomes your first priority because who's going to trust you with true riches if you can't handle worldly wealth? We invest so that our money grows so that we have more to give. The more you give, the more you receive. When you give, it is given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. You can't beat God giving. And then spending becomes the last priority. We have to spend on things, but you spend for what you need. You plan for it. You save so that you can spend. A wise person saves for the future, but a foolish one spends whatever they get. So we're going to shift our power to investing first so that we can give and then spend and plan for our spending in that order. And this is what it really looks like when we are going to walk in wealth. It's a step by step process. Number one, since you know God is the owner and you are the manager, the first thing you're going to do is tithe. Give at least 10 percent of your income back to God because it all belongs to him in the first place. Next, you pay yourself. That is to save, put some money aside for you before you pay your creditors. Then you're going to have your budget, stick with it, give every dollar in your budget an assignment. We assign 10% of our budget to ties. We assign a certain percentage of our budget to savings. We assign a number for our mortgage, for all the things that we want to do. Money you may assign for vacation because you want to put aside for that, but give every dollar an assignment. Remember, if you tell your money where to go, you won't have to wonder where it went. We're going to save. We don't want to be caught off guard by small financial emergencies. So we are going to have at least three preferably up to six months of our expenses saved in our fully funded emergency fund so that we can then begin to invest at least 15% of our earnings should go to investments. These are long-term investments that will grow for us over time so that you can give generously, retire on your own terms at the time that you want to and leave a legacy for future generations. That legacy is not only the wealth that you leave for them, but the information, the education that you're getting, share that with your children, with your grandchildren, with others, so that they can do the same. And lastly, we wanna protect and safeguard those things that God has entrusted to us so that they are available to give. Now, remember I asked you at the start of this to make a commitment. Hopefully you've been thinking about that as we've been going through this process. And I want to ask you now, what is one change you will commit to making this week to move a step closer to financial freedom? Type that in the chat. What's the one change you're going to make this week to move a step closer to financial freedom? So I'm going to stop sharing now so that I can answer questions and we can um, hear about some of those or read about those changes that you're going to make to become financially free. I see some people saying save first. That's good. All right, what questions can I answer for you? Again, I apologize for the technical difficulty. So um, let me know what questions you have and we can try to go through it step by step. And Pastor JP, if you um, want to join, my contact information is up here, um, lbaker at ascentum.com. Um, email me with your questions. Also, if you would like to talk one-on-one about your pronunciation, personal finances. If you email me at the um, addresses on your screen now, I will send you a link to um, where you can schedule a complimentary 30-minute consultation with me and we can talk about your specific 
financial situation and see whether or not financial coaching is for you or if you want to join one of the group classes that we have where we go in depth on these topics. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. This has been absolutely amazing. And persons are already making their commitments. I'm seeing people saying they're going to create a budget, stop buying Starbucks coffee. I'm glad. Listen, Dunkin' Donuts is better anyway, but just make it at home. <laughs> All right. Start doing the snowball. Awesome. Review and reduce subscriptions. That's certainly something I was actually sitting here doing as you were speaking. I say, you know, I'm going through all these things I subscribe to, but never use. And yes. It, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, it sounds good in the moment that you're about to do it. Somebody says assigning every dollar, save a thousand dollars in preparation to buy a child's car. Here we have a question from Angela W. What monthly budgeting tool would you recommend? I'm not consistent using Excel. Okay, I use every dollar. That's what it's literally called every dollar.com. It is a um, it's free and allows you to do um, create what I call a zero dollar budget so that you put in your income, you assign it to the various categories, and your budget is not complete. It will not be finished until you have assigned every dollar. So every dollar.com. Every dollar.com. Please make sure you uh, take advantage of that. Is that a free resource? It's free. Awesome. Absolutely free. Um, yeah. So that's a, that is a good one. Awesome. Every dollar dot com. And I'm making sure I'm sending my email today for my 30 minute free consultation. So listen, anytime somebody offers you these types of resources at no cost I, and, you know, I, I'm going to make sure I say at no cost, not free, but at no cost, uh, please make sure you take advantage of it. All right. That 30 minutes could really change your life and really lead you as well into deciding that you need to do more than 30 minutes to get your life on track. Uh, yeah. Everybody has just been giving glowing remarks as to how this uh, conversation today has helped them. Uh, if we can uh, display that email address for um, Lisa one more time. Now, somebody just said that they're going to cancel uh, Planet Fitness. I saw that. Okay. You know, canceling Planet Fitness. But that also means since we're stretching in fitness, that you have to have some sort of Another plan point. without cost to make sure that you do take care of your physical health. There are certain things that we do need, gym memberships, so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to cancel Planet Fitness, you know, for me, you know, I have three gym memberships. So maybe of the three, I need, <laughs> you know, I have yeah, three. Of, I do because I work out at a private gym uh, every, four times a week. But also when I'm on the road traveling, when the world oh, opens sure. back up, you know, I wanted to be able to use non-hotel uh, fitness, fitness facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, the but, you know, LA Fitness is pretty much everywhere. So I don't need the third. That's got to go, you know? So- yeah. Yes. Angela W. asks another question, which is what percent would you recommend to pay yourself? That, so it's a good question. The, 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 at the very least, very least, I would give myself 10 percent, 10 percent to God then first, then 10 percent to myself. So then the eight, that means you have now 80 percent of your income to budget for everything else. Awesome. Yeah. And you you grow into that because remember, we want to invest 15 percent, but you grow to that so that it will take time to get there. Yeah. I, I want to share just very quickly, you know, I used to hold all of my money in my checking account, you know, because I was just afraid of seeing my account ledger go below a certain number. And so I didn't want to spread things out. And so I had an experience the other week where uh, my checking account balance was lower than I would have liked, but I remember, you know, wait a minute, I've got this money through the digit app that just kind of holds in its own escrow. Mm -hmm. I've got money in savings over here. I've got money in investment over there. So just because the checking account that I was looking at didn't have the amount that I wanted in, I wasn't broke. That's right. And it was an amazing feeling at that moment to know that I wasn't broke. Amen. So this it's a good it's a good feeling. And that's one of the ways in which some people manage their finances. Right. You have your checking account that you use to pay all of your bills, for example. And then you put your 
savings and money that your short-term savings, your long-term savings in other places that you're not touching. And so if you do it that way, it's okay that your checking, your checking account may go to zero every month or every two weeks until you replenish it with your next paycheck. As long as you're managing that just for your bills, that's okay. Cause you have money elsewhere. That's right. And it's liberating when you're living by a budget and you know where your money is going that way, when somebody comes with their ass, Mm-hmm. They want to borrow what they need. You can simply look at your budget and then honestly say to them, I don't have money for that. Because if you don't, if you haven't assigned money for that thing that they're asking, you, you don't have that. It's assigned to something else. So that means it's not available. Yes. It, yeah. It, I, I see um, Raquel said that about just talking about anxiety mm-hmm. about getting started. And that is a common Thing. So you're not alone. It can be very difficult to look at your financial situation, but you must because you cannot conquer what you will not confront. You mm-hmm. have to look at it. You have to know what those bills are. The debt snowball talking about ordering your debts. You need to figure out who all you owe, whether you're paying them right now or not. How much do you owe? What's the minimum payment you can give them? You need all of that information. So gathering all of that information to start is key. It is key. Wow. If there are any more closing questions, please throw those in the chat so that we can address those because we're right at the one hour mark. Uh, Student loans. Yes. God knows. Uh, We've had discussions around that. I am in probably close to $200,000 of student loan debt. I made all of the typical college and graduate school mistakes, Um, you know, buying cars, paying rent, you know, taking out extra loan money to do all that stuff, taking vacations off student loans. Yeah. And and you're you're not alone. Many people have done that. And most students don't have the financial education and information to know what that really will mean for them down the road. It's I get money now. I don't have to pay it back. Oh, that's cool. But it's really not because at some point that bill comes due. Most people don't read the terms of that. You just sign it because you want or you need the money for school. But there's so many ways to fund college and not go into debt. Most scholarships go ungranted because people don't apply for them. There's funds for that. You can start at a um, community college and get those prerequisites out of the way where it's inexpensive before you go off to the big school. There's a number of ways to do it so that you don't have to come out of college hundreds of thousand dollars in debt and not be able to earn a salary that's even equal to what you owe in student loans. Yes. Someone asked about high yield um, savings accounts. So the online banks, VARO, V-A-R-O is one that has, they pay, I think, the highest for the online banks. Um, Chime is another one that has good interest rates. Synchrony Bank. Um, So you can research. If you just Google um, best online interest rates, for example, you'll get a list of banks and you can... um, do that again, but Varro, Chime, and Synchrony are three really good ones. My money's at Synchrony. Awesome. Do you re- do you recommend paying the minimum on student loans? Um, I do. If you um, because I, I do not recommend if you can avoid it. Do not defer your student loans. And I know some you may have to. There are rare situations in which that's really necessary. But deferring student loans is not a benefit. It just makes your loan grow. You owe money longer, especially now. Right now, student loans have no interest. You're not required to make a payment. This is the time to be paying your student loans when there's no interest so you can get ahead of it. So, yes, pay your student loans. And you're going to pay the minimum on everything except your lowest balance debt to begin with if you're using the debt snowball. And so when I practiced this, <laughs> I had sound going, everything was working. I'm not sure what happened, but that's okay. Um, hopefully the concept is is still there. Somebody's asking about savings bonds. Savings bonds are not the best. Um, they're safe, but low return, very low return because it's a, you know, a safe investment. So you're going to 
for your um, emergency fund. You want to have that liquid and put that in one of these accounts that I recommend where you're getting a pretty good interest rate on it. Um, and for investing in longer term things, you can have bonds as part of your portfolio to have balance. But if you really want to see your money grow, you're going to have to put it in things that have higher risk because risk and return kind of go hand to hand. Awesome. Student loan forgiveness. Yes. And, and you know, for people who work in professions where that is, you know, a possibility, yeah. please look into that. You know, one of the things that my mother used to t tell me a long time ago is, you know, when there are resources out there that can help you that don't have a cost, you know, you need to research them and engage in them. And just mm -hmm. as you said, a lot of times that money just sits there goes unused and then rolls over to the next cycle for the following year because persons just didn't fill out the application or write the essay or do the things that were necessary to get a hold of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Mani asks about mutual bonds. Yeah, all bonds in general are um, what we'll call safe investments. These are, these are um, ways to preserve income, but Again, they have very, very low returns. You're not going to get very much interest on any bond. Um, and so, again, this is where you get to sort of specific situation. You have to look at your financial situation. I can you know, tell you what would make more make more sense for you. But in general, bonds are a good, safe, stable investment, but very low return. And so you need to have some of that. I have bonds in my portfolio because, you know, it, and that's about, you know, mama, you say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. It's that concept. You want to diversify. So you want to have some bonds and things that are stable. Just, you know, your money is safe. You want to have, you don't want it to be all high risk things where you, you know, can potentially lose all your money. So it, it's having a balanced portfolio that fits for you and where you are in life. If you're younger, you can take on more risk because you have more years potentially before you're thinking about retiring. If you're planning to retire sooner, you want to be a little bit less risky because you don't have as much time to make it up if one of your investments isn't performing like you'd expect it to. Uh, Karen Roseman asks, where are you located? I love to hear this because it's my hometown. I am in Baltimore, Maryland. And I have... Um, clients, people I talk to that are everywhere. So that's the beauty of this virtual um, and technology that we have today. I can meet with you wherever you are. That's right. I do have a cash app. Yes. Somebody that wants to be a blessing to me. Um, thank you so much for that. Now, do not make fun of me when I tell you my cash app. <laughs> it is the dollar sign the number 22 and the word hot, too, too hot. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, yes, that is. <laughs> but of course you can look for me as Lisa Baker. <laughs> yes, and uh, Ms. Gibson, you actually took the words out of my mouth. I was going to invite us at the end of uh, our time to be a blessing to Lisa today. Uh, Cash App, uh, Tutu Hot. Tutu Amen. Hot. <laughs> hey, and I'm encouraging myself in the Lord. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, so Saints, go on over to the Tutu Hot uh, Cash App and send a nice hot offering this morning uh, to be a blessing to this great woman of God for her time and uh, her gift to us. We are grateful. Thank you all so much for being with us this morning. Um, I wish everybody an amazing rest of this Holy Saturday. I pray God's blessings upon uh, your celebration of the resurrection. On a personal note, I bid all of the family members of Hope, Hope North, Hope Daytona, Hope Online, a blessed farewell. It is never goodbye. It is always see you later and farewell. Well, what an amazing way for us to seal our time uh, together as pastor and people by making sure that we take care of the resources that God has given us. For those of you who say, Pastor, I want to stay in contact with you. I would love to stay in contact with you to be able to give you updates on 
where I'll be, if I'm traveling, preaching in the area, uh, doing music. I have several television appearances coming up. The Lord is blessing. Also to send out motivational messages. Um, the week after next, we're going to resume prayer. Uh, it's going to be in a different format, uh, but we're going to resume not this coming week, but the following week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.45 a.m. online virtual. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to uh, minister, to continue to minister, even though it won't be under the banner and moniker of Hope Fellowship, the Victory Center. So for those of you that love uh, or would love to follow me, I would love uh, for you to do that. And I'd love to be able to connect with you. Uh, you can text CONNECT to 386-222-1077. Zero. Again, that's 386-222-1070. Text connect to that number and we'll be able to keep in touch one with the other. And so this morning, I'm going to pray the benediction over you. We'll pray God's blessings over you as we uh, adjourn from this time, but also as we transition into new seasons of life and into new seasons of ministry. I want to pray God's blessings upon you. May the Lord God bless you. May the Lord God keep you. May the Lord God lift up the light of his countenance and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Now unto him, the Lord God, who is able to keep you, my brothers and sisters, from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever to the Lord God who promised in his word to do exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think according to that power that's at work within us. To that God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both in the church and world without him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love each of you. There's nothing you can do about it. Have an amazing day on purpose.